Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glenlivet Books. Comments made by Defence Minister Rajnath Singh about Veer Savarkar have created a storm of controversy. His critics say he's manufacturing history and he's making up facts. His supporters say he's deliberately highlighted facts that have been conveniently and politically forgotten. So where does the truth lie? That's the key issue I shall discuss today with the well-known historian and biographer of Mahatma Gandhi, his grandson Raj Mohan Gandhi. At the moment, Mr. Gandhi is a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in America. Mr. Gandhi, let's take it step by step so that it's easier for the audience to understand. First, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh said that amongst the many falsehoods about Veer Savarkar is that he filed multiple mercy petitions before the British government. But the truth is, Savarkar filed seven in all, and they started in 1911, 1913, and 1914. So when Rajnath Singh says that it is a falsehood to claim Savarkar filed multiple mercy petitions, isn't Rajanath Singh completely wrong? Well, yes, he is, I'm afraid, completely wrong. It is a fact, not a falsehood, that Savarkar filed a series of mercy petitions starting quite soon after he was sent to the prison in the Andamans in 1911. So, yes, he is completely wrong. Now, the second thing Rajanath Singh has said, and I'm quoting him, that Savarkar did not file these petitions for his release. But the truth is, in his own petitions, Savarkar calls what he's doing a petition for clemency. And if you look at the petition of 1913, and I'm now quoting, he asks the government in their manifold beneficence and mercy to release him. Well, that's clearly a request for release. So once again, isn't the defense minister completely wrong? Well, when someone says to British rulers, you are kind, you are beneficent, you are merciful, please release me. If these words are not humble requests for release, what are they? So there's absolutely no doubt about it. He intended well, to ask for mercy. Well, in his own words, it is so clear. Yeah. Okay, that's absolutely clear. Just for the sake of the audience, I'll underline it. The defense minister is completely wrong when he says Savarkar did not file multiple petitions. And he's completely wrong when he adds that these were not petitions for Savarkar's release. Savarkar he, did file multiple petitions and he specifically asked for mercy and clemency. He is completely, totally wrong. Thank you, sir. Let's then come to the third thing Defense Minister Rajnath Singh has said. And again, I'm quoting from the defense minister. It was on Gandhi's suggestion that he, Savarkar, filed a mercy petition. Now, the truth is, Gandhiji was approached by Savarkar's younger brother, Narayan Rao, for help. And Gandhiji, in January 1920, replied to Narayan Rao. I want to quote from that letter. This is what Gandhiji said. It is difficult to advise you. I suggest, however, framing a brief petition, setting forth facts of the case, bringing out in clear relief that the fact that the offense committed by your brother was purely political. Doesn't it follow from that quotation that what Gandhiji advised was explain the facts and thus argue the offense was political? Gandhiji did not say appeal for mercy and clemency. So before I respond to this strange claim that Gandhi advised Savarkar's mercy petitions, uh, let me speak of where Gandhi was when he wrote the letter that you have just quoted from and what Gandhi was doing at the time when he replied to Savarkar's younger brother. Now in January 1920, Gandhi was in Lahore. He had been in Punjab, undivided Punjab from September of the previous year, 1919, traveling from district to district in Punjab to collect evidence of the atrocities in a Punjab that was being run by Governor Michael O'Dwyer and terrorized by Brigadier Reginald Dyer. The Jallianwala massacre had taken place in April of 1919. Following that massacre, the people of Punjab were terrified. They were terrorized. 
so terrified that they were unwilling even to contribute some rupees for a memorial for the victims of the massacre. At meeting after meeting in Punjab, Gandhi told them that India's honor was at stake. If they were not willing to contribute, said Gandhi, he would sell his ashram in Sabarmati to raise the memorial. Money then began to flow in. Now, what had, this is uh, the point uh, I wanted to make, what had terrified the Punjabis and what had enraged Gandhi was not just the massacre, but the infamous crawling order that some of you will remember. Indians, as is well known, were ordered to crawl on their knees and hands on that Amritsar lane where an English woman had been attacked during demonstrations. Gandhi was affronted, offended to his roots by this crawling order. He called it worse than the massacre. Now, could Gandhi have advised Savarkar to go down on his knees before the British? The suggestion is ridiculous. It is unthinkable. Maybe, uh, Karan, you will give me the chance later to discuss the Gandhi-Savarkar relationship and the differences in their, in their outlooks. But on your question, we should ask, why did Gandhi write to Savarkar's younger brother, Narayan? Well, he did so because he had been requested more than once by Narayan on behalf of Savarkar to, to do, do something to obtain Savarkar's release. And the release also of Vinayak's older brother, Ganesh, was with him uh, imprisoned. Now, contrary to what Rajnath Singh says, Rajnath Singh says, I've heard him, I've heard the video, Gandhi ji ke kehne par Savarkar ji ne likha. These are Rajnath, Rajnath Singh's words. Contrary to, to these words, the initiative and the request for help comes from Savarkar. Narayan tells Gandhi that his, that his older brothers are weak in their prison. Even though a royal proclamation of the previous December, December 19, two, three months before this, had announced an amnesty for many prisoners, his brothers are not in the list of those to be freed, he says. Please advise, he requests Gandhiji. Gandhi wants to help. He suggests, as you point out, that the brothers should, has, should send a short letter emphasizing that their activity is political. Gandhi's reply and the letter from Narayan Savarkar, the younger brother of Savarkar, are both easily available, accessible, in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi volumes. Now let's get the picture right. Rajnath Singh is asking us to believe that a letter, a letter that Gandhi writes in January 1920 to a request from the Savarkar brothers should be interpreted as an advice given by Gandhi nine years earlier that Savarkar should send a multi petition. The suggestion is beyond, is absurd beyond description. It is laughable. You've said two very important things in that answer that I want to pick up and highlight for the audience. First of all, you said the very suggestion that Gandhi advised Savarkar to plead for mercy is ridiculous and unthinkable. You also said later on it was absurd. And the second thing you said is that the letter Gandhiji wrote in January 1920 wasn't of his own volition. It was in response to a plea for help from Narayan Rao, Savarkar's younger brother. And as you said, there was absolutely no way that in those circumstances, after the Jallianwala massacre and the infamous crawling order, that Gandhi would have advised anyone to go down on their knees and plead for mercy from the British. And that's, that's very clear. And I'm simply underlining it because that literally attacks the very core point made by Rajnath Singh that Savarkar pleaded for mercy at Gandhi's suggestion. However, in fairness, I should point out that roughly four months after that letter that Gandhiji wrote in January 1920, he also in May of that year wrote an article for Young India, which was about the two Savarkar brothers who were at the time incarcerated in the Andamans. And Gandhi himself said that in that article, he was presenting what he called a case for their release. So even though Gandhiji clearly and definitely did not tell them to plead for mercy, he did on consideration believe that the Savarkars had been wrongly detained and deserved to be released. That's why he wrote a case for their release. Uh, yes, that article that Gandhiji wrote was also available, easily accessible. Of course, Gandhiji wanted Indians wanting independence to be released, whether or not they agreed with him on everything. In the previous year, 1919, Gandhi had similarly asked for the release of the famous Ali brothers, Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali. Uh, now in this May 1920 article that you referred to, 
Gandhi points to the Royal Proclamation of December 1919 and says that the Savarkar brothers too should be released. There is no doubt on that score. He wants them released. All who fight for India's independence should uh, be released and they get his support. But there's a very interesting couple of sentences in that article Gandhi wrote in May 1920 for Young India. I'm going to quote them because in a sense, those sentences reflect how Gandhi saw the Savarkars. He says, the Savarkar brothers state unequivocally that they do not desire independence from the British connection. That's such an important sentence, I'm going to repeat it. The Savarkar yeah. brothers state unequivocally that yeah. they do not desire independence from the British connection. And then Gandhiji adds, on the contrary, they feel that India's destiny can be best worked out in association with the British. So Gandhiji didn't see the Savarkars as freedom fighters. He saw them as British subjects willing to continue to be British subjects, but wrongly detained. Uh, and Gandhiji is quoting from a statement that was made on behalf of the Savarkar brothers. Uh, so, uh, you're right that the Savarkar brothers are emphasizing their loyalty to the British connection at this point. Uh, at the same time, they are uh, in their own way working uh, for independence. So Gandhi concedes that. He uh, he's aware of that. He wants them released. He, he, uh, he sees them along with many others who are detained. Even if there are differences, Gandhi wants them released. Let me now quote from one of Savarkar's petitions for mercy. It's specifically the petition sent by Savarkar in 1913. I believe it was the second of his seven petitions. First of all, Savarkar writes, I for one cannot be, sorry, I'll begin again. I for one cannot but be the staunchest advocate of loyalty to the English government. He then says, I am ready to serve the government in any capacity they like. And finally, he ends that petition with the following sentence, where else can the prodigal son return but to the paternal doors of the government? Now, are those the words of a freedom fighter? They certainly don't sound like it to me. Well, this is a pathetic letter, Karan. The sentences are hard to hear. They must have been very hard for you to pronounce. Yet Savarkar wrote them. True, he wrote them more than 100 years ago. Still, it is sad today to hear them, and it is sad that he wrote them. So would I be right in saying that these don't sound like the words of a freedom fighter? Or am I being unfair when I say that? Well, I, I think you are underlining the obvious, uh, Karan. Once again, to be absolutely fair, it is also true that there were several other people incarcerated in the Andamans who also wrote letters of mercy and petition to the British government to secure their release. And they are considered freedom fighters by India today. Satyendra Bose is an example from 1908. I believe people involved in what's called the Kakori conspiracy are examples from the late 1920s. So to be honest, Writing letters of mercy and petitions for clemency was quite common. Savarkar wasn't unusual when he did it. Yes, it must be recognized that many wrote mercy petitions. It must also be recognized that many did not. Many did not. Sadly, Savarkar was in the category of those who sent mercy petitions. That's another very important point you're making, Mr. Gandhi. Many may have written mercy petitions, Savarkar was one of them, but equally, many did not. In other words, there were many who suffered like Savarkar in the Andamans, in that dreadful cellular jail, yes. but did not write mercy petitions, and Savarkar was not one of them. Savarkar was one of the many who did write mercy petitions. So it's not that everyone wrote mercy petitions. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. In which case, let me put you a point that his critics often make to ask if it's a fair comment or a prejudiced one. Many of his critics say that these mercy petitions, and remember there were seven of them, are in a sense proof that he was a coward and a traitor. Is that going too far? Uh, yes, I think it is going too far. 
those who never wrote mercy petitions, despite severe trials, and there were so many of them, certainly would have felt let down and betrayed on hearing what Savarkar did. But a man's whole life should not be judged solely on the basis of some disappointing or regrettable actions. That's another very important point. A man's whole life should not be judged on the basis of one or two or a few disappointing actions. Are you being deliberately generous and humane when you say that? Or are you being a historian when you say that? Well, I, I'm trying to be a, an objective observer of, uh, yes, I know I, 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 I think I would like myself to be judged on the basis of my whole life, not on the basis of some terrible things I may have done. So I would like uh, to, to assess others also in the same way. In which case, let me quote something written by one of Savarkar's better known, and I would say better biographers, Vebha Purandare. This is what Mr. Purandare has said. In my opinion, the petitions do not make him less of a revolutionary or an apologist for British rule. As a historian and a biographer yourself, would you agree with Mr. Purandare's comment? Well, I would say that the petitions by themselves do not make Savarkar an apologist for British rule. Nonetheless, we should remember that quite apart from these petitions sent prior to 1920, when later on the war started in 1939, and again later when Quit India was launched in 1942, Savarkar stood on the side of India's British rulers. There is irrefutable and documented evidence of that. Jinnah and the Muslim League on one side, Savarkar and the Hindu Mahasabha on the other side, both stayed firmly outside the freedom movement during those crucial years. Now by 1939, Jinnah had decided that not the British, but the Hindus were his chief foes. Savarkar had made his peace with the British years earlier. He had decided that not the British, but Muslims were his chief foes. Now Gandhi, Nehru, Patel, Subhash Bose, Azad, and the bulk of the Indian population thought that British rule was the chief foe. Hindus and Muslims had to live with one another despite their differences. The British would leave one day, but fellow Indians would remain and had to get along with one another. Now, this fundamental difference that I've described does not make Savarkar an apologist for British rule, but it certainly reduced the fervor for Indian independence that Savarkar had displayed before he was imprisoned. But you're again making a very important point that many perhaps are not aware of, and certainly it needs to be underlined for them, that as late as 1939, and in fact, even as late as 1942, Savarkar stood with the British. And in a sense, this does exemplify what Savarkar wrote, and I read it out earlier in his 1913 petition when he said, I for one cannot but be the staunchest advocate of loyalty to the English government. He said that in 1913, he proved it in 39 and 42. And this also exemplifies what Gandhiji wrote in that essay for Young India in 1920, when he said, the Savarkar brothers state unequivocally that they do not desire independence from the British connection. And again, in 39 and 42, Savarkar was proving the point. I'm afraid that is, that is the record in history. We're coming to the end of this interview, Mr. Gandhi, but I want to ask you two more questions. First, about the relationship between Gandhiji and Veer Savarkar. I believe they met in 1909 when they were both in London. I believe Gandhiji admired the way Savarkar had tried to escape from the, through the porthole of a ship in Marseille. But at the same time, when Kasturba Gandhi died in 1944, Savarkar refused to contribute to a fund created in her name. How would you therefore describe the relationship between the two men? Well, first let me point out, Karen, that Savarkar's famous escape from the ship uh, had taken place after Gandhi and Savarkar had met in London. However, there is no doubt that Gandhi, along with every Indian hearing about that escape, that dramatic escape, admired it. So, uh, now I won't uh, condemn Savarkar for not contributing to the fund created in Kasturba's memory. 
which was set up, I might add, for the welfare and education of rural women. Yet it should be remembered that apart from being Gandhi's wife, Kasturba, who died while in detention in 1944, she represented thousands who suffered greatly while in prison for participating in the Quit India movement, even if not all of them died in prison as Ms. Kasturba had died. Now, as for the relationship between Gandhi and Savarkar, let me first speak of the crucial differences uh, in their outlooks. Now, on the Hindu-Muslim question, their difference is most clearly brought out in what Dr. Ambedkar wrote in 1940 in his well-known book, Thoughts on Pakistan, published in 1940. So let me quote Dr. Ambedkar. Quote, strange as it may appear, Mr. Savarkar and Mr. Jinnah, instead of being opposed to each other on the one nation versus two nations issue, are in complete agreement about it. Both agree, continues Ambedkar, not only agree, but they insist that there are two nations in India, one the Muslim nation and the other the Hindu nation, unquote. Now, Gandhi, of course, was totally opposed to the two nation theory. He was opposed to it before partition and he was opposed to it when he lived in, uh, uh, for some months after partition. Now that was one major difference. The second major difference was on the road to in reach independence. Now the road of assassination and violence, Gandhi was firmly opposed to this approach. For one thing, a revolutionary who used the gun or the bomb sometimes or often killed not the targeted official, but someone else. Secondly, Gandhi argued that killing Englishmen today will definitely lead to killing fellow Indians tomorrow. So Gandhi offered another road to independence, not bombs, not guns, not assassination, satyagraha, nonviolent direct action as a superior and safer path to independence. Now, I should mention one important aspect of Gandhi's prescription of Satyagraha rather than the cult of the bomb, for this aspect is often overlooked. Satyagraha or nonviolent direct action empowered the poor and the weak of India, who were the great majority. Whereas the revolutionaries' bomb tended to give strength to the dominant high castes, to Rajas and Nawabs, the method of the bomb was likely to empower those who were already on top socially and financially. Nonviolent struggles, on the other hand, tilted the balance in favor of the poor, the Dalits, the women, the physically disabled. Here, let me quote what Gandhi said in April 1931. This is an important quote to recognize. Quote, I declare that we cannot win Swaraj for our famishing millions, for our deaf and dumb, for our lame and crippled, by the way of the sword. With the most high as witness, I want to proclaim this truth. We were able to enlist as soldiers millions of men, women, and children because we were pledged to nonviolence, unquote. Now, Savarkar's closest team, on the other hand, the RSS leadership, who made no secret of their admiration for Savarkar, were all Brahmins. Empowering the lower rungs of India's social ladder was not Savarkar's goal. So these are the differences. But let me say a word or two on the relationship. Savarkar's dislike of Gandhi was never concealed. He could never accept Gandhi's stress on Hindu-Muslim partnership or Gandhi's uncompromising commitment to an India for all, not just for the Hindus. An equally important role in this life may have been played, in my assessment, by Gandhi's commitment to a free India where the weakest Indian of any religion or any caste would have a role and would be respected. Now, I'm aware, and it is true, that Savarkar wrote in favor of inter-caste marriages, no doubt about it. He sought the consolidation of all Hindus against the Muslim other. However, I'm not aware of any call by Savarkar to the, to the Hindu high caste to acknowledge the cruelty meted out to the so-called untouchables. Now, Gandhi, on the other hand, again and again, connected all the problems that India was facing to the crime of untouchability. And as historians know, in 1920, at Gandhi's initiative, the Indian National Congress made the 
removal of untouchability, one of its prominent political goals. Now, here is what Gandhi said in 1921. What crimes for which we condemn the government, 21, this is only two years after Jallianwala Bagh. What crimes for which we condemn the government as satanic have we not been guilty of towards our untouchable brethren? We make them crawl on their bellies. We, we have made them rub their noses on the ground. With eyes red with rage, we push them out of railway compartments. What more than this has British rule done? Gandhi asks. Now, my understanding is that Gandhi's keenness on Hindu-Muslim partnership and his candor about the inequities in Hindu society infuriated Savarkar. That's a very clear answer. There were but I want, I, I want to continue a bit, if you will allow me. Quickly, sir, quickly. Yeah. Okay, Savarkar became Gandhi's fiercest foe. Gandhi had other critics and opponents too. For a while, Subhash Bose opposed Gandhi. Yet it was Subhash Bose who in '44 addressed Gandhi from Rangoon as the father of the nation. Moreover, Bose was as firm a believer as Gandhi in Hindu-Muslim partnership and equality. Dr. Ambedkar opposed Gandhi strongly. But with Gandhi's blessing, he not only joined Free India's first cabinet under Gandhi's closest political colleagues, Nehru and Patel, he architected the constitution, which abolished untouchability, gave equal rights to Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, agnostics, and others. But there were two leaders who persisted with their opposition to Gandhi. Jinnah was one and Savarkar was the other. Okay. After Pakistan was created with Jinnah as its head, J uh, Jinnah was no longer in India, but Savarkar remained in India and unreconciled for of Gandhi. That's a very clear answer. There is, in fact, enormous gulfs in the plural, ocean-sized gulfs of difference between Gandhi and Savarkar on issues that mattered closely to Gandhiji. Hindu-Muslim unity is one of them, and the way in which independence should be one is a second and the treatment and attitude to Dalits or who were called untouchables at the time is a third. And I think it's very important for the audience to remember that. No matter what Rajanath Singh, the defense minister, may try and suggest through the facts which are clearly false, which he's propounded, that Gandhiji somehow was close enough to Savarkar to tell Savarkar to plead for mercy, which is not true. He didn't do anything of the sort. The gulfs of difference in their ideology is the important factor about the relationship between the two men. One last question, sir, and I'll ask you for a really brief answer because we're running terribly short of time. How do you yourself, as a historian, view Savarkar? He's considered a freedom fighter. He wrote a highly acclaimed history of 1857, which I believe was the first to interpret the mutiny as a war of independence. But on the other hand, he is the father of Hindutva, and he made it crystal clear that he didn't believe the minorities were the equals of Hindus. So briefly, how do you personally as a historian view Savarkar? Uh, let me try to indicate very shortly both the positives and the negatives. Now, not many outside Maharashtra know of the influence of Savarkar's poetry. In his poems, his love of Maharashtra comes across. We can also sense in his poetry and in his prose his love for India's geography, India's physical space, the Himalayas, the oceans, the rivers. Savarkar was proud of India's geography, India's past, of India's talents. And that 1909 escape from the ship was talked about for years across India at the time. It did make him a daring hero. He was also a skilled uh, theoretician and ideologue. His theory that only those Indians were true Indians who saw India as their homeland and their holy land. And main Muslims and Christian second-class citizens from the start, it was undemocratic and in the modern age reactionary, but the formulation possessed a strong appeal for quite a few. And he attracted passionate followers. He was quite a personality. But an observer finds a troubling element in Savarkar's life. This element was distinct from the two nation ideology different from the notions of greater rights for some, lesser rights for others, notions that most people today would reject. That trait I'm referring to was this. Under the theory that ends justify any means, Savarkar seemed to encourage political violence. But he also made sure that, that when violence actually occurred and some people were caught and punished, he himself could claim that he was not involved. Some will find this skillful and admirable, others will not.
I can think of a common phrase in English that sums up what you're saying. He didn't practice himself what he preached to others. Some would say that's tantamount to hypocrisy. I don't want to be judgmental. I'll simply leave that thought hanging in the air. The audience can decide for themselves. I thank you, Mr. Gandhi, for joining us. I thank you in particular for establishing unequivocally that there is no question that Savarkar wrote multiple pleas for mercy and clemency, that he specifically asked for clemency, and that there's no sense in which, as you put it, it's ridiculous, unthinkable, and absurd to believe that Gandhiji in 1920, after the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, would have actually asked Savarkar to bend his knees and beg for mercy. I thank you for clarifying all of that. I don't know if the defense minister will be listening, but I certainly hope the audience who hears this will understand that whether it was done advertently or inadvertently, accidentally or purposely, they were told something that is not the truth, and you have now corrected it. Thank you very much, Mr. Gandhi. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you.